Morning, Southside. <clears throat> Special welcome to anyone who might be visiting us for the first time this morning. Grateful to have you with us. Just want to give you the right hand of fellowship and our love, and let's worship our God together. And we, we believe that the preaching of the Word of God is worship, and so we're going to continue in our worship service now by beholding the glory and the beauty of Christ in His Word. So grateful to have you. As a church, we're studying through Paul's epistle to the Romans. So if you'll turn with me to chapter 15. Again, if it's your first week, you're just a little bit behind. I'm still praying about doing a community group and starting all over again. I just feel like I, I need to live in Romans till God calls me home. So if there's a group that would be interested, let's keep talking. So it's jumped out at me. The way Paul began this letter and is now ending it, and what was in between was the greatest treatise of doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ in one letter. And so it, it's big that, that you have all this gospel that Paul's unashamed of. And we've looked at it and seen its beauty for three and a half, four years. And, and the way he began it, though, is, is my heart for the Roman saints. And I want to come see you. You're in my heart. And I, I want to be established. I want to establish you in the faith and your gifts build me up and encourage me. There's just this bond, this love, the union. We'll all be working together for the gospel. I love that your faith is being proclaimed throughout the, the, the whole earth. It's just everyone knows about the faith that's going on in the gospel. And now we've stared at the beautiful gospel and Paul is now closing it up saying, this gospel is so beautiful. The reason we want unity is to take it and lift it up and spread it and show it to the world, to the nations next door. We, we come together for this purpose. And so it matters why this gospel brings unity and how we're to use it to show forth Jesus Christ and all of his beauty. I love that you're a broken record on the beauty of Jesus Christ. Like I, every Sunday school, I get to hear it again. Thank you, brother. Thank you. So I'm praying that we get this as a church because for me, for a long time, Romans was chapter 116 to chapter 15, 13. And that's the part that I love and treasure and wanted you to know and get sewed in, and I still do. But what it is to produce is, is a church on mission for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I just repent to you as one of your pastors. It's, it's God's opening it now, and I'm beginning to see it more and more. And so I, 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 I pray that we just keep locking shields to find ways to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. You want to grow in your faith. Um, make that your life, your aim, and your ambition. So just, if, if you want to make it just learning truth, you're, you're going you're gonna to stall out. It's learning truth to behold God, to go proclaim it, and let people see and know and show them a transformed life. So I, I pray that we don't miss this. And so we see this theology of the gospel of Jesus Christ brings love relationships with the churches. So I love that this is all the churches working together to lock shields, laboring for the advance of this message that we've learned in Romans. Paul says, so I want to come for my refreshment, for a comfort from you, Rome. I, I want you to be praying for me. I want uh, to be strengthened. I want you to be encouraged in my encouragement. And there's just the, the, the beauty of the, of the oneness with all the churches because we have Jesus Christ in common. And so what we can do together is way better than what we can do alone. And with that, let me read to you Romans 15, 22 to the end of the chapter. For this reason, I've often been prevented from coming to you, but now with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have had for many years a longing to come to you. So whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing, and to be helped on my way there by you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. But now I'm going to Jerusalem serving the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased to do so. It was their joy. And they're indebted to them. <laughs> for if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things... They are indebted to minister to them also in their material things. Therefore, when I have finished this 
and have put my seal on this fruit of theirs, I will go on by way of you to Spain. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints, so that I may come to you in joy by the will of God and find refreshing rest in your company. And now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you as Paul is landing this plane that took us up to the Mount Everest of Revelation and we saw the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ. We've seen your amazing gospel that from you, through you, and to you are all things. To you be the glory forever. So thank you for this flight. Thank you by your word and your Holy Spirit what you have shown to us. God, let us offer up our bodies living sacrifices to serve you and let us see the beauty of how we lock shields to take this gospel everywhere that we can until we quit breathing. God, we live in some, some days that are preaching the end. Lord, we see so many things around us happening. And I pray, Lord, that now is the time more than ever to be done with lesser things and to give heart and mind and soul and strength to serve the King of Kings. Unify us in one goal and one aim and one ambition. God, I pray that you could do that more than we could hope or think in our midst this morning. Bless the proclamation of your word for your name's sake, I pray. Amen. Your outlines this morning, we've been working through Romans 15, and uh, last time we were together in verse 14 through uh, 21, we've been looking at Paul's kind of giving us four insights then into his ministry as he's closing up his, his letter to Rome. So he starts with the expl uh, an explanation of his boldness and boasting. And we see that he, he's bold because he's been called to this by God. God has given him this calling, and, and that takes weak people, scared people, and it makes them bold because it's God who's called me to do this. And then I'm boasting, not in anything in me, I'm boasting in what God can do through a human by his spirit for his name's sake. And so I, the, the excuse of I'm not qualified, I'm not gifted enough. Oh, foots. Yes. Okay, I'm not gifted enough. I need the Holy Spirit to, to lead and to guide. So I have boldness in the gospel and I, and I have boasting because I'm amazed what God does through human beings, his power, his name. And so that's how Paul is saying, I am bold and boasting in the gospel. Second, then he gives an explanation of his method. And I'm going to places where Jesus Christ is not named. And I'm going all up and down this Mediterranean region to plant churches. And I plant churches and then they're to take the gospel and to spread it into those regions. And I keep moving and going on. And so that is my methodology that God has given to me, a frontier mission uh, agent for God and his name. That's where we left off. And now we're going to look at the explanation of his absence and then the explanation of his need for prayer as we finish out this chapter. <laughs> I know some of you said I could never get through chapter 15 this fast. Uh, we're doing it. <laughs> we're doing it. And my heart has been just blessed by what Paul's teaching in Romans 15. So let's look at our third point, the explanation of his absence in verses 22 through 29. So Paul is now going to help explain why he's absent, and he's going to lay out his future plans to the saints there. So Paul's really letting us know his travel plans. Here's my itinerary. And, and your question is, who, who really cares about the apostles' travel log? Go back to Romans 8. Let's keep moving in that. But what's going to jump out in this passage is, I just want you to catch this, Paul always has a purpose in what he plans or what he does. And my prayer for every one of us is we have the exact same plan and purpose in everything that we do. We can gain much this morning. Paul's not willy-nilly. He is focused and directed in all that he does by the call of God. And what is clear as always is Paul wants to walk in the will of God. Someone answered in Sunday school, you know, the, pray for the will of God. That, that is Paul. I don't ever want to go outside the will of God. 
So I'm always looking and praying, Lord, guide me into your will. Look at uh, verse 32 of chapter 15. So that I may come to you in joy by the will of God and find refreshment in your company. I, I, I only want to come in the will of God. I don't want to do Paul's thing. I want to do God's thing. He wants us to be obedient. Paul wants to be obedient and to please his Father in heaven. We're right back to Romans 12.1. Every believer, this should fill your heart. I just want to be obedient to God, know his will, and be pleasing to him. So I want you to hear this. I want us to live with purpose and aim to seek and to live and to minister in the will of God. That is what drives all of his desires and all of his plans. And I think what gets tricky for us is when our desires and our plans, we try to make God fit into them. I, I, I've got this plan. I want to do this. And we, I just keep trying to get God to get, get figured it out. Come see the best way to run my life. And Paul is not, hey, here's the best. What he wants to do is go to, to Rome. And, and he's following God's will. And that's why he's not at Rome yet. And so I just want your will, oh God. I don't want to bend you to mine. I want to come under yours and follow and obey. We have much good to learn then from our text. This has been very uh, instructive to my own heart. So Paul, we have heard of your plans to come and see us. Um, we haven't seen hide nor hair of you. Are you all talk? Do you really have a true concern for us, Paul? And so the first thing he needs to do then to address, why haven't I visited you? you you've said you've desired to see us, Paul. And so Paul, they're, they're saying, Paul, I, I know your plans. They don't include me. And Paul's saying, my plans do include you. The, the, this group, this church is in his heart and they're in his plans. But he's been hindered by his calling. He's been hindered by, by what God's called him to do, this church planting ministry around Mediterranean. And I, I've been hindered because of my calling. He was about what God had called him to do. And so should we be. The principle that should order our life is if this is secondary to our plans, you're, you're missing it. My first primary call in life is your plans, God. And when you call, I follow. And I don't just change and shift and run when I don't feel something emotionally. And he wants us to get that our calling is to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we all have this beautiful calling with our days. Paul did not go to Rome yet, but it was the desire of his heart, but not until he finished his calling in the Mediterranean. So I just want you to see that. This truth has anchored me many times. When you get weary in ministry, you get tired. It's, it's the will of God, and you continue, and you persevere because of God's name. And I pray that it does the same for you. I was just thinking through, um, because I'm around young marrieds a lot, and we've had like 80 babies in a couple months. <laughs> these, these moms, man, it, it gets hard being a mom, not sleeping all that's going on with many of you right now. And, and I just want you to see that there's a calling to, to give your life, to keep nurturing and training and bringing Jesus to that little child that one day they'll, they'll say, you, since childhood, I've known the sacred writings of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it's, I don't turn from it. I don't turn from it. I, I don't turn from the tiredness of being a deacon and laboring and giving your life and serving. I, some of you are just admirable what you're doing and you just won't quit serving God. Your jobs, this calling from God. Is, is, I'm laboring and working hard, being a testimony, worshiping God by the way I work. Paul said so that you can share. You can help in gospel advance. And you're giving and you're donating for the gospel to go to Mexico and to Lakewood and all over. You're, you're getting it. You're persevering in it. Singleness. 
the hardness and the journey sometimes of the loneliness. And I'm watching some of you just persevere in it and stay faithful and shepherd and evangelize and find joy in God. That's, this comes together with wherever you sit this morning. Teachers, it's the hardest time ever to train children. And some of you go in there day after day after day and love them and nurture and preach and teach. And I just, this is it. The will of God, don't be turned away. We got some military people in here, praise God, that go. Hardest time to be in the military probably in the history of our world, a country, not world. And you keep being faithful. We thank God for it. So that's for free. Paul's going to outline his plans in verses 22 through 29. And this is so cool. He's going to give three destinations for his plans. And the first one is, he's go, I'm going to go to Corinth from Corinth to Jerusalem. And I'm going to go by ship. And I want you to hear it. It's 800 miles. 800 miles. And then I'm going to go to, to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to Rome. 1,500 miles. And then from Rome to Spain uh, to resume my pioneer missionary work, 700 miles. So what does that add up to? 3,000 miles. That is a lot. And back then, it was way harder to travel. Journey, walking, boats, ships. So some 3,000 miles of traveling. And what is more is the torches have been lit from Jerusalem to, let me see if I can get this better this week, Alaricum. Ooh, that was better. Alaricum. Some 1,500 miles. He's already journeyed up and down, planting churches all over. And he's just been beaten like a dog. And my question is, Paul, you're done. You did your faithful ministry, churches planted through the whole Mediterranean. What you've accomplished by the grace of God alone is amazing. Take your rest. Retire, right? Retire. And so just, I, I got to clarify this. I'm not against retirement. I think it's a biblical thing. So retire, it's beautiful, but never retire from God's calling. I hope you get that. Never retire from God's calling. And that's what we see in Paul. And I want you to get that in your heart until I breathe my last. I do not retire from the call of this gospel. It compelled him. There's no, hey, if you're a Christian, you're supposed to do this or you have to do this. That'll never bear fruit. That's not Paul. When you drink up the love of God in Christ Jesus that we saw in Romans, the love of Christ compels me. You have a life that just can't quit. There's no way Paul can quit. I've tasted the love of God in Christ. I had this sweet lady early on, uh, uh, Erlene, it was Erlene, uh, her, her mother named Annie Clifton. And Annie Clifton used to, she had this horrible arthritis and pain, and she would make little blankets for every child that was ever born into this church. Could you imagine what would happen to her now? Um, <laughs> But she would just pray for this ministry in these long, painful nights when she couldn't sleep. And every time I went over there, she said, how can I serve this body? And it just never stopped until she breathed her last. Whitfield preached some 40 hours in a week. And, and when he, I think it was when he turned 40, he said, today I resolve to begin to truly live for Christ. <laughs> and he preached his last sermon from a balcony and he just proclaimed Jesus went in and died. What a great way to finish. Brainerd is dying on his bed of tuberculosis. And on his deathbed, he rejoiced that he was able to teach a young Indian boy how to read the Bible. Livingstone was a London missionary society. They said, where do you want to go? He goes, anywhere as long as it's forward. You don't have to be Paul. But whatever he's called you to do to advance the kingdom through meals, prayers, giving, acts of service, I don't want you to re retire. And I don't want you to think the Christian life is just for you to take this in and sit home until, get your pajamas, sit on the roof till Jesus comes back. You're missing it. I want to make sure you don't miss. Galatians 6, 9, let us not lose heart in doing good for in due time we shall reap if we don't grow weary. Don't grow weary in doing good. So let's look at his visit to Rome. Verse 22, for this reason, the reason he just gave in verses 18 through 21, the demands of missionary labors, for this reason they prevented me. And now I'm finished. And now I can come. The missionary service in the Eastern Mediterranean is complete. 
So verse 23, now with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have had for many years a longing to come to you. For, for I long, at the beginning of the letter in verse 11, chapter 1, he said, for I long to see you in order that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. This is this deep desire. I'm longing for you, saints. I want to be encouraged and find refreshment in your company. And in verse 24, whether I go to Spain, whenever I go to Spain, I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there by you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. I want to come spend time with you and I want you to assist me. And this Greek word for assist, it's a real technical term that meant to help missionaries on their way. It's more than just good wishes. Uh, bag says it, it meant to help with food, to help with money, arranging companions, a, a means of travel. And so I just want you to catch this. The church in Rome could help with the spread of the gospel uh, in the West by being a sending church for Paul. <laughs> I'd love to be a sending church for Paul. And so they, he's letting them cooperate and participate in their calling. So for this, Paul will finally be coming to see the Romans face to face whom he loved and prayed for constantly, they really were in his heart. In verses 25 through 27, though, he, he adds now, I'm going to visit Jerusalem. <laughs> he says, but now I'm going to go to Jerusalem. Uh, I am going. It's a present tense. The departure is imminent. It's really already begun. And I want to go there, and I want to serve the saints. And it's this Greek word, uh, diakonon. What, what word do you think we get from that? Diakonate. It, it's the word deacon the table servers. And so I want you to just don't miss this. Paul is the greatest pioneer, pioneer missionary that has been known in the church. And he says, I'm going to go wait tables. I'm going to go do the deacon service. And this is such good leadership and good Christianity. I just instantly go to Christ washing the disciples' feet. And so I say, how are you going to serve them, Paul? What well, he says in Macedonia and Achaia, which is southern Greece, uh, verse 26 for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. So this word for contribution, the Greek word is koinia. And we all, we've heard that word a lot. Koinia is what we do. It's our fellowship. We share, we partake in these things together. And so Paul says, I'm going to come make a contribution, a sharing the, the commonness of these two churches, the fellowship of, of sharing your resources with a church that's struggling. So it's for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. And all I could come across this week was uh, there was a severe famine which Agabus predicted in Acts 11:27. Josephus writes about a famine in 44 through 48 in Jerusalem. So there's some kind of famine, there's some kind of poverty going on in Jerusalem. <clears throat> and for your homework this week, the offering that Paul's talking about in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 is he's detailing it and he's, he's going to explain it. Uh, and if I had more time, I think I would read those for you. But I just to summarize it, they make this offering, and Paul says, you gave it in great affliction. You, you were under great squeezings and trials. You were under deep poverty. And you did it with an abundance of joy. And I just want you to see the beauty of this offering is you're, you're poor. You have poverty, and you guys are taking from whatever you barely have left and you're giving it to the saints in Jerusalem, and you're doing it with this great joy. Open-hearted, open-handed, so beautiful. This is the gospel. So wait a minute. These saints are poor in southern Greece as well, and they're giving out of their poverty. Why are they doing that? Well, look at verse 27. <clears throat> they were pleased to do so, and they were indebted to them. They, they felt a debt. What What debt? For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them also in their material things. And so the Gentiles, we studied this in Romans 11, they're, they're sharing in the spiritual things of the promises that were made to the Jews, this, this blessing of the nations and through Abraham and all that has taken place. Uh, I might just read one part of it. Romans 11, listen to verse 17. For if some of the branches, this is the Jewish nation, they were broken off. And you, and this is Gentiles, we were wild olive branches. We we're just wild. That's what we were. And we were grafted in among them, and we became partakers with them of the rich root of the olive tree. Do not be arrogant toward the branches then, the Jews. But if you're arrogant, 
Remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will say to me then, branches are broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. So they have inherited from the Jews these enormous blessings. Can I talk someone into closing that shade, right? Oh, you guys are great. Um, Inherited from the Jews the enormous blessing of being wild olive shoots. And And they've been engrafted into these blessings and promises. And now we share in the nourishing sap of the olive root. And Jesus said, uh, salvation is from the Jews. And so this offering is a demonstration of their gratitude. Don't miss this. It's breaking down those walls and barriers that existed between Jew and Gentile of the deepest hatred and separation. And it's just broken down in Christ. To, to John 13, all men will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And I just want you to see, this is a picture of the beauty of what Christ has done they're giving out of their poverty to the Jewish Christians. It's just, they're so one body now. Don't miss, like, because we live in it, we don't understand how amazing this is. The one, they're one in Christ now, and they're giving out of their poverty to help the Jews in what they're going through. And I personally think that is why Paul is going to add 2,000 miles to his journey. And he could have sent Timothy, Silas. He could have just sent any deacon. Why is he going to go? Because I think Paul's looking at this going, this is the gospel. So you don't go to Rome via Jerusalem. Why go to Spain if this gospel doesn't bring Gentiles in the fullness of the gospel and the oneness of the people of God? Why go? I'm going to put this on display. The whole gospel is being proclaimed right here with what's going on with Paul. So be overwhelmed. 2,000 miles, he's going out of his way, being the deacon, serving because of the beauty of Jew and Gentile, one new people in Jesus Christ, loving each other. Woo! Amen. Paul, just, Paul just said, I only, uh, I'm thinking of the Jerusalem council, and, and he presents his gospel, and they're talking about what, what do we do with the Gentiles, and he says, they only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. In Galatians 6.10, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially those who are of the household of faith. And so here's our unity and oneness and our mutual love, and we care about the poor, and we meet each other's needs, and we help each other. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I want you to catch this man's heart, that he would add all this trouble when his passion is to get to Spain because there was a need, and he would come and be the diaconate to meet those needs. And so I just want you to think about one second where he's going. Please don't miss this. In in, in Acts, he says, and now behold, bound in spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem. So he's talking about this, not knowing what's going to happen to me there. Did you know they didn't like him in Jerusalem? (laughs) Except here's what the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. Hey, you're going to Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit tells you all that's there is bonds and afflictions. Why would you go? I don't consider my life of any account as dear to myself in order that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. My life isn't my life. And I just want to be obedient to the will of God and, and follow wherever he leads and guides at any cost. And some of you have been beat up in ministry. You've been beat up in churches. I want you to get, I will not turn away from giving my life for this. My life is not dear to myself any longer. It's, it's, I've been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I just want to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. And before he goes, this guy named Agabus took Paul's belt and he bound it around his own feet and hands and he prophesied and said, the Jews will bind the man who owns this belt. And the saints, they begged Paul, don't go. Don't go, they love Paul. And in Acts 21, 13, Paul answered him, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I'm ready not only to be bound, but to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll die for Jesus. I'm not worried about bonds and afflictions. I'll even have my own head cut off for this name. 
to go testify solemnly to where the will of God has led me. That's where Paul is headed with his offering. Why? Because this gospel will preach the gospel louder than I ever could with my mouth. I won't be content until I can say this from my heart. I do not count my life as dear to myself to finish my calling. Salinas and Andreos and all who are going to go with you guys. You have a calling to testify of the grace of God in Lakewood and plant churches all up and down that area until Denver's filled with gospel churches. Don't consider your lives as dear to yourself. Go preach. Third, he plans to visit Spain. In verse 28, therefore, when I have finished this, and have put my seal on this fruit of theirs, I will go on my way by you to Spain. And I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. <laughs> Paul, Paul said, man, I'm coming to Spain. My question is, did he ever reach it? Well, we don't know for sure. He was martyred in Rome. The, the way they finally got him to shut his mouth is they did cut his head off. So if he was imprisoned only once, he never went to Spain but some think he was released for some time and went to Spain and then he was arrested a second time and killed. There's some records that might insinuate that he did get to Spain. Can't be dogmatic. Clement of Rome said Paul reached the limits of the West and that was a meaning for Spain. <coughs> the Murturian Mert canon mentions the departure of Paul from this city on his journey to Spain. So we don't know if he made it or not. Um, he could have, but the, the, that's not the main issue. So as Paul has laid out his plans, here's what I want you to catch. He sees his need for prayer. And so he enlists these saints in Rome, like we saw in Colossians so beautifully today, is to intercede for him at the throne of grace. And so he has three basic concerns that he wants them to pray about. In all Paul's letters, he's very dependent on prayer, and he, he gives different reasons and things he wants them to pray for. <coughs> so we're going to look at three reasons and close out. Jerusalem, in verse 30, <clears throat> unbelievers, I pray that, pray that I might be delivered from those who are disobedient in Judea. And so Paul is walking into the lion's den. He knows the Jews have a great hatred for him. He knows they want to put him to death. He's faced their opposition wherever he's gone. Uh, he has scars all over his body from it. Uh, so this is not a, a clear and present danger. It's true. It has already happened. And he's coming back now to their headquarters because he wants the gospel proclaimed with these Jew and Gentiles loving each other, making the offerings. I'll be, I'll be killed and beat and martyred if I have to be. <laughs> For he was one of them. He used to try to put them to death. So he knows the intensity of their emotions and their feelings and their desires. He knew that his preaching of the cross of Christ, salvation comes by grace through faith alone. It's all the work of Jesus Christ and what he has done on our behalf. And he had put himself at enmity with these Jews who believed it was by works, by keeping the law. And so as Paul comes in there with that hatred, pray for me. Pray that I would be delivered so that I can take the gospel to Spain. Church, I'm enlisting you. Pray that I get protected there. Second, he says, I want you to pray for the believers in Jerusalem. What? That my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints. So you've had tensions between the Jews and Gentiles, and you've seen it through this whole epistle. Acts 15, the Jerusalem council, what, what, what the Gentiles, what do they need to keep of certain laws, circumcision, what do they need to eat? There's all these tensions in the church, and there's a hangover where you're Gentile dogs, and you're outside the promises, and so all these things are going on, and he's saying, pray, because they've, they've been prideful toward Gentiles, and now I'm bringing an offering from the Gentiles to say they love you and want to help you. I'm sure there might be hard feelings toward Paul preaching to the Gentiles. And Paul asked for prayer that this Gentile offering would be accepted for the spirit in which it was given and not seen for some wrong motive. And that this would do much to advance the kingdom of God and all people will know that we're his disciples because we have love for one another. Will you pray for that? And then thirdly, he says, will you pray that I may come to you in, in joy by the will of God and find refreshing rest in your company. So just be praying that I can come and, and just be healed and nurtured in your company. I, I was just struggling on Friday and I went over to this sweet couple's 
house, and it was just like the balm of Gilead to have their love and wisdom and compassion. And I just kind of came out of there like revived. <laughs> so I, I get what he's asking for. Just pray when I come that you guys will revive me because it's been hard work for 1,500 miles and all that I've been through. There's something sweet about compassion um, when you're, you're under fire. So what jumps out is how intense Paul is asking for that. This is not something he just throws out as a, reli- a religious colloquialism. I want you to catch this. Hey, pray for me. Yeah, I'll pray for you, brother. Like, this is so much bigger than just kind of those little things. So I want you to look at what Paul's asking. I urge you, same word in Romans 12, 1, I urge you to offer up your bodies a living sacrifice. I urge you, brethren, I truly believe that as a man grows in grace, he feels as dependent upon God more and more. Every man, woman, child, you just more and more get, I need grace. I asked for little prayer when I began the ministry. Now I urge you, pray for the elders, pray for one another. We all need grace. Urge you, brethren, I have a love for you, a longing to see you. We've never met. We're born again by the same Father, quickened by the same Spirit, redeemed by the same Savior. Do you have a love for the saints everywhere? This, this is what we got. So brothers, let your prayers surround me with divine protection in Jerusalem. I'm not asking that you come with swords and be my bodyguard. Pray. That's all I'm asking, that God would protect me. And then strive together with me. This is a beautiful Greek word. The, there's a preposition, sin, which means with, and agonizomai, which means to agonize. The root word agon it was used in athletic contests to describe the struggle that took place maybe in a wrestling match where you're wrestling for life or death. I, he says, I want you to strain every spiritual muscle you have with me in prayer. Agonize with me. Come. It's the same word when Jesus was in the garden. It said, being in agony, he was praying fervently and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. There's a war. Greg was talking this morning. The devils and the cohorts in the world and our own flesh. This is a war with the greatest significance of any war that has ever taken place on earth. Guys, this is a war for eternal souls. Whether these souls will spend eternity singing the praises of our great God or weeping and gnashing their teeth for all of eternity. That's the war that we've been called into and we need to pray and we need to get into it. And and it's not peacetime. It's going on in your own home with your own children and brothers, families, and relatives. There's a war. There's a war going on in Lakewood. The difference is, is what does one do with Jesus Christ? Do you believe in him and have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ or have you played religion your whole life? It's going to be an eternal answer that's going to have to be answered on Judgment Day. Have I surrendered? Have I believed and entrusted my life to this Christ? And does my life follow what I believe? That's the battle that we're in. In the midst of humanity, God is calling out a people unto himself, the church of God. And he's advancing his kingdom in the hearts of men. And there is warfare going on. There is a battle. This is not peacetime. Our enemies did not sign a peace treaty. They hate God. They hate grace. They hate everything about Jesus Christ. They want to see your soul destroyed and all those around us. There's no urgency. Romans 13, wake up, time, pray. Got to pray. I got approved this week for when we get out. We're going to have our our seven-week Sunday school come up now where we're going to have newcomers and and there's going to be the fruit of the Spirit study in here. And then when we begin uh, the next round of Sunday school, I'm going to have what I call the boiler room during Sunday school. And we're just going to meet in there. We're going to read passages and pray and pray for ministries, pray for those being trained up. And it's just going to be a group that gets in there and just prays for this. Pray. Boyce says, does prayer work? Yes. It's God's appointed mean to spiritual victory and to right ends. Hodge says prayer has a real and important efficacy, not merely in its influence on the mind of him who offers it, but also in securing the blessing for which we pray. Prayer accomplishes much. So how effective, I just want to close, I've said that three times. I want to close with how effective was this prayer of the saints for Paul. I want you to see, is prayer effectual? Does it work? 
first. He was protected from the unbelievers in Jerusalem. We were told that the Jews had plots to kill him. There were some who took a vow and said, I will not eat until Paul is dead. It's amazing how God answered that prayer. He used Caesar's power as a shield to protect Paul. Who had ever thought the way he was going to answer it was using Rome's authority and power to protect him and get him from being killed from the Jews at that point? Second, his gift was received by the church in Jerusalem. And in Acts 20, it says they received us gladly. They rejoiced over the love of the brethren and what they did for them and the gospel just shone. And then thirdly, did he make it to Rome? Three years later, he made it to Rome in chains. <laughs> that wasn't probably the way he thought, but God brought him and he brought him in and put him in stockades and the gospel breaks through the whole praetorium guard. Uh, and it says they, they received him in Rome and they weren't ashamed of his chains. So yeah, all three prayers were answered, probably not in the way we would think. And I want you to get that as your application more than anything. The way God will bring about his purposes is not the straight line that we all want. <laughs> God uses prayer to accomplish his purposes. I will die on that. The force of God's children crying to their Father in heaven, these prayers accomplish much. One man said of the prayer meeting, we shall never see much change for the better in our churches until the prayer meeting occupies a higher place in the esteem of Christians where we pray fervently in our secret place, our community groups, uh, a corporate time of gathering where we're always interceding. We can plan and organize till the cows come home. We need the power of God to change us and to, and to bring in the nations. Prayer. And then Paul the Jew, who is the apostle to the Gentiles, says the Jewish benediction over his Gentile readers. I'm going to say that again because I said it fast. Paul the Jew, who is the apostle to the Gentiles, says the Jewish benediction over his Gentile readers. Now may the God of peace be with you all. Amen. This gospel brings peace with God, peace in your own heart, and peace with others. Blessings. The peace of God be upon all of you. So beautiful. I'm just going to give a few points of application. Going on, well, I'm just, okay, never mind. <laughs> I, no, my, remind. When I look at how he answered that, it really is breathtaking. And I just think as the saints of God, to be able to pray and trust God in the way he does things. And I've watched so many of you journey things that they're so confusing at times and I can't understand them. And then we have these breakouts where all of a sudden you can see what God was doing. And you're like, to God be the glory. And I've sat and we've wept with people with cancer and so many different things. And just watching how God is working and what he's doing. I just, I want you to surrender your wisdom to God and understand how he works is going to be different than you're ever going to plan or think. And to come under that and trust and hope and believe. So going on to the will of God, secondly, does not mean then that there won't be trials, hostility, difficulties, or rejection. I think one of the biggest lies in American Christianity is anytime something hard comes, we say, oh, this isn't the will of God, and we check out. And so I just want you to know that if you're doing the will of God, it will be resisted, attacked, rejected, all hells against it. Quit, quit buying that lie, okay? Perseverance in what God has said. Paul's our example. You, you just couldn't stop him. And, and when I look at how it was all answered, I would have thought, man, I need to get out of Rome. I, I'd never go to Jerusalem. That, that guy just put a prophecy on me. They're going to beat me. I'm, I'm going over to Spain. <laughs> so just look at it, persevere, endure. See the beauty of the church all working together, praying, caring, helping. Paul, Paul, all that happened was these saints in Jerusalem praying for him who've never met him. We're all working together. I've never met the Leightons in Spain. Pray for him. 
I've never got to meet the Deckers. Pray for what God's doing. We're just all one trying to advance the kingdom of God. Pray for all these churches in Denver. Pray often for gospel advance. Ask others for your gospel opportunities. Praying for each other. Hey, I got a chance to share with this guy down the road. Will, will my community group pray for it? Hey, can you pray for me? I got to meet with this person next week. Let's pray right now. Just get people surrounding and praying all our evangelism. Has all your doctrine led you to this sweet place? <laughs> That's a big question. Are you the Bible answer man with no heart for others, no heart for the gospel? Just, blah. That one needs to be dealt with. I was thinking the last time I flew, and I, I know you've all tasted this. When you finish, they go, thank you for flying southwest. Next time we, you travel, we hope that your travel plans will include us. And they didn't give you anything, and you hit bumps the whole way, and you're like, you're not going to be in my travel plans. <laughs> for us, I hope that your travel plans, wherever you do and go in your life, will include Jesus Christ as your chief end, your chief goal, and your chief ambition. Make your travel plans of life of the blessing and the joy of Jesus Christ. I don't want to go after anything else. I was just thinking this week of, I, I became a grandpa like fast, like boom, boom, five of them in two years. I, I was never a grandpa before, and I've just been thinking through it a lot. And I just got one goal. I want to love them with agape. I want these little kids to just know this safe love. Just what a place to come. And I can tell them of the love of Christ that surpasses all comprehension. Every sippy cup. I just, those things leak on me every time. I, last week, I was sitting on the floor playing with uh, baby Marta. I, I, oh, baby, bear baby. So I'm sitting here with my little granddaughter playing with dolls, going, why am I doing this? <laughs> and she's two, and she's got this little kit. She takes my blood pressure, and when she's done, she goes, 120 over 80. I'm like, how does this little girl know 120 over 80? First, I wish it was that. <clears throat> and every gummy, every hug, there's a purpose and there's a will of God and there's a plan and it's just want to show them Jesus and talk to them. And every counseling meeting, every study, every sermon, every lunch, every coffee is that you would know the blessed freedom of giving your life away and making much of Jesus Christ. Advance his blessed offer of salvation through his work alone. Get your goal. Don't lose it. This is what we could learn this morning from Paul. I don't count my life is dear to myself. Whatever he's called you to do, I pray that you never retire from this calling of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I pray that, that um, you've entered into the calling. I pray that you're not sitting here never entering into what the gospel has brought us into and content with that because that's American Christianity, but it's not biblical Christianity. And so I'm praying that you wake up and the way you wake up, it's not smelling salts. It's Jesus Christ crucified in your place. And you look at him and you go, I don't count my life as dear to myself. I got one life and it's going to be spent for the name that's above every name. And that's how I'm going to spend my days. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. <laughs> God, thank you for that sweet little voice giving the amen to the word of God. Lord, thank you for the parents who are training that little one to know when to yell amen. God, I pray that you will just cause us to set our aim and ambition on Jesus Christ, knowing him, being conformed to him, helping saints be refreshed and encouraged to take this message that can save from hell. God, burden our hearts. Don't let us go, eh, what's for lunch? Oh, God, stop that in us. Kill that flesh. Just wants American pie instead of Jacob's ladder that leads to heaven. God, work in our hearts and in our lives. Let us, let us be so alive 
to Jesus Christ in this gospel. Thank you for Paul letting us see his heart. And we give you all the glory, praise, and honor. Amen.